indeed, I'm going to talk about RAG optimization or fine tuning. And what I'm going to do is, is give a basic overview of that process, um, how we approach it at Snorkel. RAG stands for Retrieval Augmented Generation. The term was coined about several years ago, pre-GPT-3. Um, the idea was to address limitations of AI uh, when AI needs access to an external knowledge source. How do you get the pieces of that knowledge source that are relevant to the AI's task? Um, and those limitations still exist today, um, even with large context window models. So we see RAG is remaining relevant, or really the retrieval piece of RAG is being relevant. <clears throat> if that knowledge source is too big to fit to the context window, that's still true even with large context windows today, um, especially if you have you know, huge document repo with thousands of documents are very long. You might not even be able to fit that within some of the largest context windows that we see right now. Um, but importantly, it's also really relevant uh, when that context window or the knowledge source contains a lot of distractors. There may be cases where there's low hanging fruit that you can kind of pick off, you know, filter out. Uh, maybe you have a huge document repo and you know that only if you're going to be relevant to any given AI task, why give it the entire document repo every single time? Why not filter out the ones you know will be irrelevant and only allow it to focus on the ones that will be relevant? Um, so th those are the kinds of use cases in which a RAG is still relevant, even with long context window models. And what I'm showing you down here is just a cartoon version that I'm going to unpack in a little bit. Um, those of you who are already familiar with the basic RAG have probably seen something like this already, where you have unstructured documents, you divide them up into chunks, you feed that to a retrieval model that usually involves embeddings, and then you take that retrieved context along with the prompt for the AI task, concatenate it, feed it to the large language model to then generate a response. Um, often that's kind of question answering kind of tasks, but it's not just question answering. So I'm gonna unpack this in a more granular view now, because this is how we view RAG and how we've been approaching this with, with our customers. We, we have documents that indeed we have to chunk, as I mentioned before. Um, we've actually found uh, across customer use cases that it's also useful to use some of these more traditional techniques where you take these documents in these chunks and, and you tag them, um, you, you know, classify the document, pick out key pieces of information like tables, tag them as tables if you know there'll be tasks related to tables. And then what we do is we take that, the whole set of documents, chunks, and metadata that we've created, feed that to our embedding model and our retrieval model. Um, and then it's really this enriched information plus the embeddings that we feed to the context window for the large language model. Um, and so what I'm going to do over the next few minutes is I'll drive home two take-home messages and, and, and focus on key parts of that pipeline. So take-home message one is that the whole pipeline matters. Every piece of that process is really critical for, for a fine-tuned RAG system for it to work. And it's really important to be able to optimize each of those components for your, your separate use case. So um, let's zero or uh, home in on some of these, these components that we've seen to be especially important for optimization and customer use cases. Um, I'm talk I'll talk about how we split up the documents, convert them to chunks. I'll touch on a little bit about creating this metadata so it's not just abstract. I'm going to spend a few minutes on embeddings and how we fine tune retrieval models. Um, those are going to be the pieces I'll focus on today. All of this pipeline is relevant, but what I'm highlighting here are the pieces that, that we think are uh, really critical and the value that we bring as a company to, to customer use cases and helping the fine tuning process. So let's begin with splitting and chunking documents. You can think of a document chunk as kind of a basic unit of information that's retrieved and passed to a large language model. And it's important to make sure that we're, we're really using the right units. You know, what is a unit of information? Is it a sentence? Is it a word? Is it a whole paragraph? Um, you know, if, if the unit is too big, you run the risk of including too much signal for the large language model. If your basic unit is the whole document, you run the risk of um, really burdening the large language model of interpreting the entire document to answer a question, for example, that may just involve one or two paragraphs. Um, and it may get thrown off, go down a garden path. If there are other paragraphs that may, may look like the ones that are relevant, uh, but may cause it to hallucinate because it contains information that actually isn't relevant. Um, if your units are too small, you run the risk of leaving out too much context. For example, if you take your document and you just split it into a bunch of different sentences, um, you run the risk of you know, really giving your large language model kind of a word salad in which each individual sentence doesn't really make sense if the context isn't there for the large language model to understand that sentence. Uh, how do we actually define these optimal units? You can think of two basic approaches. One is fixed, so you can define a unit as kind of a fixed window same number of tokens, 
um, in every chunk. That's often what you see in these APIs um, in which you do rag kind of off the shelf. You know, you have a window, for example, 500 tokens, divide up the document, the even 500 token chunks. Um, there are also dynamic approaches uh, that are kind of sensitive to, to the content of that document. So it's what we call like a dynamic chunking algorithm. If it's kind of physical, you may use basic features uh, like paragraph information, you know, headers. If it's what we call semantic, you may actually may try and interpret um, the, the document on a semantic level and really divide it with respect to topics. And uh, we actually have an adaptive algorithm that the research team has been working on that, that's both dynamic and semantic. And that's one that we've, uh, we're seeing in our experiments and some of our customer use cases is actually the most powerful. So I'm actually going to go into a little more detail on that one because I think it's going to highlight the importance of chunking and getting it right. Um, what I'm showing you on the right-hand side, I'll, I'll talk about in a minute, but it's, it's from an experiment that we've run. Um, the, the basic idea is that we take, we take a document and we kind of naturally carve it up at the joints. So if you have a document that has multiple topics in it, let's treat our basic unit as kind of that topic. So instead of paragraphs, it could be you know, sets of paragraphs that are related to that topic. Um, and what we, we found is that when we divide up documents in this way, we get dramatically improvement, dramatic improvements in the question answering ability of large language models, about, about 20 to 30 points in Lyft on uh, three different question answering tasks when you compare it with just paragraph based chunking. Um, 10 to 20 points in Lyft when you compare it with an alternative semantic chunking algorithm offered by the Llama Index uh, API. And what I'm showing you here on the right hand side, it's just an example of a result from our experiment. So what, what I'm showing you here on the horizontal axis is, is sentence position. So you take a document, you index it by sentence. Um, this blue line is just a piece of an embedding space. And I'll talk about embedding spaces in a little bit, but it's just showing how there, there are changes in the embedding space that represent changes from topic to topic. And these red lines are kind of a ground truth notion of where we should optimally demarcate these chunks. And what I've done here is I've taken newspaper articles that are somewhat similar in theme, they're all newspaper articles, but very different in terms of topics. And as you can hopefully see with these green lines where we've inferred the optimal way of dividing up this series of newspaper articles, our algorithm can naturally divide it up at the, at the right unit. So this was a case in which we had an article about the Canadian broadcasting system, transitioning to an album review, then a book review. These are obviously very different kinds of information that we want to divide up and treat separately our algorithm is able to kind of discover those boundaries naturally. Just another example to help you know nail this down for you all, so it's not just abstract. You know, I gave you a representation from embedding space. Here's a real document. And on the left-hand side, I'm just showing you an example where we've used a default in many RAG APIs where we have a fixed window size. As you can hopefully see on the left-hand side, if we use this fixed window side, we're really decimating some important contextual cues. Like for example, uh, if you ask a large language model that requires this whole table here, you end up feeding it pieces of this table and you run the risk of really um, giving it chunks that don't have a proper context to really answer the question. Whereas on the right-hand side, this is a representation of what our, our algorithm can do, where you're more naturally chunking this document um, at natural boundaries. You know, you get the whole table. And if you ask the uh, large language model a question that requires access to this table, it gets it in one whole chunk. So it has all the context it needs to answer that question. So let's we'll leave it there for now. Let, let's just move on into the pipeline. Metadata, how do we extract metadata? Why is it, why is it valuable? We've seen metadata be really useful, uh, really in two, in two respects. One is that you can actually leverage metadata to help create a training set for your retrieval model. So just taking um, the, the document example I showed you before, you know, if, if you're able to take that chunk and tag it as a table, you actually create training sets of other tables that might be in that document and have a training algorithm that really teaches a large language model how to optimally answer questions that require access to tables. So there's no reason to just have a, a more sophisticated AI algorithm naturally discover this table if we can more easily define it of the more traditional information extraction approach, which is one of the uh, approaches that we use at the company. You can also use metadata directly in the retrieval process. You know, suppose you have a retrieval uh, algorithm that's very sophisticated, can you know get topics that we know are going to be relevant to a specific task. Well, if, if we know all, beforehand, pre-retrieval, what's a table and what isn't, and these questions all related to tables, so no, there's no reason why you can't just pull out those tables before even giving it to the retrieval model and just concatenating it in with all the proper context. So in other words, use what works. 
And if we know that their tables are relevant to the task, you should just pull out tables if they're tagged as such. Um, so how do we do this? Uh, I'll just go over two basic approaches and, um, that, that we use at the company. Uh, we use information extractors and where you break a uh, document apart, you use these chunks and you tag chunks with key pieces of information, such as is it or is it not a table? Maybe you know we're interested in dates, you know, date extractors. Um, we're also building classification models and we can take whole documents and classify them. Maybe you have a whole document repo. And um, if you have documents related to the medical sciences, you know, it's really important to know which are devoted to you know, a specific kind of medical sciences like cancer uh, you know, versus diabetes. If a question related to cancer, pull out all the documents classified as cancer before feeding into the model. Just you know, again, breaking this down, showing you an example from a PDF. You know, again, classification model applies to the whole document. Um, you know, you could, this one will just classify as research. Um, we could tag it with different topics. You know, this one happens to be related to gener generative AI, large language models. Information extractors that we build usually apply to the chunks, kind of the subcomponents of the document that we think might be relevant if, if we need a more granular view for the large language model. Moving on to the embeddings and the retrieval model, I'm gonna group these together and you'll, you'll see why in a minute. So what I'm showing you here is, is really a more holistic diagram of the retrieval model and the, the role that embeddings may uh, play. Um, there are actually alternative ways of performing retrieval. So I'm just showing you one way uh, purposely because it's one of the simplest ways. The idea is that you have a prompt to a large language model. You already have your chunks. You feed them both to an embedding model that essentially turns them into strings of our series of numbers. You know, we'll call that a prompt embedding and a chunk embedding. And then what you can do is take those two embeddings and compute relevance scores for each chunk. And it's really just a similarity score. So for each chunk embedding, you can say, well, how similar is this or how relevant is it to the prompt? You can score that on a scale of zero to one. And the ones that you think are most relevant are the ones that you then feed to the large language model. So you can almost think of it as a scoring mechanism that allows you to filter out all the distractors that I mentioned at the beginning. And so really importantly, the quality of your embeddings really drive the quality of a retrieval model. Um, if your embeddings group together, you know, chunks that are relevant, chunks that are irrelevant, you're actually gonna have a really poor retrieval mechanism because it's not gonna know how to score them properly. I'll go into that actually in, 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 over the next few slides. Um, so again, why is this important? They're used to score models and how relevant they are. Pre-trained embedding models we found often for uh, domain-specific use cases lump together relevant and irrelevant chunks for a given task. And so it's important to really be able to fine tune them to be more granular and kind of separate out chunks that are relevant from chunks that are irrelevant for each task. But how do we do this? Um, what, what we do historical, we have a, a fairly methodical process in which we first, we choose the right kind of pre-trained embedding model. We use something called the MTEB benchmark that you can find on Hugging Face. Um, we usually will pick one that we think is gonna map best to the customer use case, depending on the kind of task it is, perhaps a domain. Then we baseline the ability of that pre-trained embedding model to perform well in our retrieval uh, method, saying how good is it already at distinguishing relevant from irrelevant chunks. And then we fine tune it to better disting distinguish those kinds of chunks. Let's talk about the baselining just for a minute. And I'll explain this plot on the right, because it's really gonna help right from the point of, of what fine tuning can do to you, uh, do for you. So uh, again, you know, we wanna select a suitable base, we kind of pre-trained model that performs good enough on public benchmarks. Um, what I'm showing you on the right-hand side, though, is what we obtained from baseline the solution. So uh, on the x-axis, what we have are these relevance scores that I, that I mentioned, these scalars, these numbers from zero to one that tell you how relevant a given chunk is to a given task. As it, and on the y-axis, just the count of prompt chunk pairs. And so these are, these are basically uh, histograms. And as you can hopefully see, there's a lot of overlap here from the pre-trained model. The orange are chunks that are relevant to a given task. The blue are ones that are irrelevant. Um, and, and as you can hopefully see, the scoring mechanism here doesn't do a very good job at separating them out. You know, being having a high score above 0.5 gives you almost no information about whether something is relevant or not. Um, and in fact, there really is no good scoring threshold here that would tell you how to make a decision about whether to include a chunk. So something needs to change. We need to fine tune the embedding model to the use case and the domain under, under question. So how do we do this? We found that data development is really key to this kind of fine tuning process. Um, and, and so what I'm showing you in the right hand side here are three components that we use for the training set we, that we developed for fine tuning. The top and the bottom are actually fairly standard. The one in the middle is one that we've innovated at the company. So I'll just actually describe that last. 
The first one, manually labeled prompt and chunk pairs. These are ones in which a subject matter expert would go in and just give you a chunk question, tell you whether it's relevant or not, kind of manual annotation of ground truth. And importantly, what they'll tell you is not just examples of, of prompts and chunks that are relevant, but also chunks that are irrelevant. Cause you wanna give your fine tuning algorithm negative examples and like, you know, not just what to lump together, but what to you know, divide up in your embedding space. Now, manual data collection is, is laborious. Subject matter experts are really expensive. You want them to go through and, and create thousands of examples. They make hundreds of dollars an, an hour, often um, just not feasible. Me, maybe use them to, to evaluate, but you don't want them to sit down and create your training set for you. On the bottom here is, is another kind in which we have synthetic prompt and chunk pairs. I'll describe that in the next slide a little bit more. Um, in the middle, um, programmatically labeled prompt and chunk pairs are ones in which you can actually use your subject matter experts and scalably create uh, a prompt and chunk pair data set um, in a way that captures some of their intuitions. So I'll unpack these a little more before moving on to the actual fine tuning process. You know, as I mentioned, mainly uh, created label uh, prompt and chunk pairs come directly from the subject matter experts. Um, we often leverage those as ground truth for evaluating the retrieval process. We don't want to use anything that's synthetic. We want to know that if a retrieval process is going to work well, we can measure that on something that a, a subject matter expert is actually validated. Uh, these programmatically created label prompt and chunk pairs, what we've innovated at the company, uses kind of weak rules of thumb and metadata to scalably create a larger training set um, that can be more robust and you can help fine tune to the most expected types of prompts. And we offer this actually already um, in, in some of the customer projects that we've developed, where you can go in and say, you know, overall, what would define a good chunk for a given question? This last piece, this synthetic prompt and chunk pairs are ones in which you take a, a pre-chunk document and you actually use a large language model to generate questions for those chunks. Um, so it's a very clever way of creating a high volume of training data that's used as standard practice in certain parts of the AI field. And what we found in practice is that this can help fine tune retrieval models for unexpected kinds of prompts, because it's a lot more general. You have a very broad based set of annotations or kind of chunks that you're creating questions for, and it's not restricted to something that a subject matter expert might have thought of ahead of time. What do you do once you have this training set? So you have these three components, manually labeled prompts and chunk pairs, programmatically generated, and then this purely synthetic process, what you do, you, you put them all together into one big training set and you use a fine tuning algorithm to create your fine tuned embeddings. I won't get into the mechanics of the fine tuning algorithm today, just for time's sake, it's, it's somewhat inside baseball, um, but there are APIs that allow this fine tuning algorithm um, to operate uh, pr pretty elegantly that are easy to use off the shelf. What do you get once you fine tune this embedding space? Well, as you may recall on the left-hand side in, in our you know, pre-trained embedding space, we we're kind of lumping together relevant from irrelevant chunk pairs. You know, there was no really good threshold for relevant scores that would it was able to distinguish them. On the right-hand side, we're seeing the results of our fine tuning process in which as you can hopefully see, these two distributions are very clearly separated. Relevant chunks have pretty high scores on average. Irrelevant chunks have pretty low scores on average. And so we would, you know, in this case, have a threshold of maybe about 0.7, you know, any relevant score over 0.7, count that as a relevant chunk included in your context window. So I've, I've gone over the embedding algorithm for a bit. Hopefully, um, you know, you can see that that it, it's useful. Um, it makes sense to fine tune it. You, you can have better abilities to distinguish relevant from relevant chunks. Well, what do you do with those relevant scores? So, you know, that last video take home was embedding models matter to the success of retrieval model. Well, also you need to be able to use your relevant scores optimally um, because all we have so far is an embedding model that gives us scores. How do we turn that into a, a set of contextual signals that the large language model can learn or use for, for its task? So why is this important? Well, if we had a, a really liberal criteria for including chunks and say, well, anything over a really low relevant score include it, um, you know, again, we have this problem where we get a really noisy signal and also kind of slower large language models because they have too much information to wade through. Um, this is kind of similar to the trade-off that we saw with chunking, where you know, if, if your scoring threshold is too high, if you're if you're too conservative and, and what you define as a relevant chunk, you actually have a risk of missing something that's really important. And for those of you, you who are familiar with kind of precision versus recall decisions and classification problems, it's it's um, very analogous. So. How do we navigate this trade-off between what's effectively precision and recall? 
what we've uh, figured out in the research team is how to use chunks based on ranked relevance scores and the size of the context window. We'll get into a lot of the details right now, um, but here's a, just a cartoon representation of, of how it works and the, and the customer problems that we've helped solve. On the left-hand side, um, you see what's usually done by default and some of these um, off-the-shelf APIs that do rag for you, where there's just some fixed number. Take like the top three chunks in terms of score and just include those. And what I'm showing here on the left-hand side, every blue chunk here in this cartoon is relevant. Um, if you just pick the top three, you miss these two down here. And you've also underutilized your large language model context window. Whereas if you use a more optimal algorithm that's based not just on um, you know, a top three or the window size itself, but also on the relevant scores, you're more assured of using every blue chunk here, every chunk that's relevant. That's kind of the basic idea is um, it's, a, it's a scoring algorithm that allows you to fill up your context window with as many chunks that you think are relevant and no more. Just to sum up, I, I, I've gone over basic pieces of this pipeline, um, you know, splitting, uh, chunking optimally. With, you know, we have a proprietary algorithm that does this pretty naturally, classification and information extraction algorithms that let us uh, you know, create metadata that can in turn be used to training our embedding models as well directly in the retrieval process. And then we talked about the retrieval model itself. How does it use embeddings to compute relevant scores? And, and how do we leverage these scores to actually feed the right signal to the, the context window for the large language model? Um, and so again, just to recap, hopefully what you've seen today is that the whole pipeline matters and that you wanna optimize each piece, of, each piece of this pipeline. You can really get pretty dramatic improvements and, and the performance of your RAG system, if you really focus on the entire pipeline as a system and not just you know, the parts that are machine learning based, such as, such as the embedding model.